Okay, well, with a title like uh, Games Our Brains Play, you would think that I am a neuroscientist or psychologist or psychiatrist. I'm none of those things. I spend most of my professional life as a facilitator, helping creative teams solve their most difficult problems, hopefully in creative ways. So all of my insights come from the front line and working with teams on a daily basis to track down solutions to their, to their challenges. And what I want to share with you today really began several years ago when I was tapped to help a very special team. I work with all kinds of teams, all shapes, all sizes, none like this. It was the Los Angeles Police Department bomb squad. It was a few years after 9-11, and LAPD Counterterrorism Command had selected 12 of their best bomb handlers and charged them with rethinking and redesigning the way bomb threats were handled in the field, in this new age of what are called IEDs, improvised explosive devices. And as part of the vetting process, I had to meet with the department psychiatrist. And this wasn't one of those, hey, can you come out and help us do a little brainstorming kinds of things. This was, we have a serious problem and failure is not an option. And he was a very serious gentleman, and he let me know in no uncertain terms that whatever skills I had and whatever confidence in those skills I thought I had, it would be put to trial by this particular team. In his opinion, they were an extreme team, an elite team, all type A personalities, uh, high adrenaline, among the highest paid on the police force, and not so thrilled about spending two days locked up with some civilian who had absolutely no idea what their job was all about. And he wasn't exaggerating. I remember that very first morning, the, the young officer sitting right next to me leaned over, hand on his holster, and said, I just want to let you know, I'm only here because I was ordered. As I looked around the room, I, I could tell that um, he was not holding a minority position at all. And I like to start all of my creative sessions with sort of right brain warm up and I knew for this particular team I'm gonna to have to do something a little bit more potent than sort of your run-of-the-mill uh, brain teaser or, or icebreaker so here's what I did I put them all in handcuffs it seemed appropriate right in my search for sort of the perfect thought starter I had run across this hundred year old parlor game called the prisoners release and it's pretty simple. You're handcuffed together with rope handcuffs. A and B must free themselves without removing, replacing, or untying the handcuffs. In other words, they can't leave the original hands at any time. And I thought, well, gosh, they ought to kill it on this, right? I mean, they're, they're cops. They, they're handcuff experts. They're used to working with a partner. And as I looked around the room, I thought, you know, they, they thought I could tell that this was a no-brainer. And I had to agree with them. Um, I had solved it in a few minutes, so I really thought that they would kill it right away, and hopefully the trash talk would start and take the, the heat off of me. I can't show you what happened that day, unfortunately, but what happened that day was so profound to me and shocking that I would use this exercise with every team from that point forward. So what I can do is I can show you what always happens when I put the handcuffs on and I say go. I promise, the bomb squad looked no different. It was pretty hilarious. No one solved it. Um, now fast forward 10 years. I've done this exercise with tens of thousands of people all over the world. The action is always the same, the results are always the same, and the success rate is absolutely dismal. Like 5% success rate, like one in 20 pairs gets the solution inside the five minute mark which is kind of why I like it so much, because it's nowhere near as difficult as the problems people have to solve in their real work, but it catches us doing all the things that get in the way of good creative problem solving. 
So what I like to do is try and uh, decode some of what's going on. And because of all of that overwhelming evidence of 10 years, I had to spend time with neuroscientists and psychiatrists and, and psychologists to sort of figure out what was behind what I was observing. And the short explanation in simple terms is this. Our brains like to play games on us, and they do that using the very same well-worn patterns that, on the one hand, help us make it through the day in an effective and efficient way, but on the other hand, can trip us up when we have to open up our minds and employ the power of our best creative thinking. And in case you didn't catch what I just did there, I made a distinction between the brain and the mind. And that's not just me, that's science. But we now know that the biological brain is sort of like passive hardware, sort of capturing uh, all of the information and data and experiences we have every single day. And the conscious mind is more like active software, which directs our attention and does something with all of that experience we take in. But it's not just any software, it's software that can actually rewire the hardware. That's sort of the marvel of what we know as neuroplasticity. Uh, so, what I want to do is share some of the more prevalent games with you very quickly, but then leave you with a couple, a couple simple ways that you can use your mind to win those games. And I promise I'll show you, I'll show you this solution to the prisoner's release, okay? So when I say go, the very first thing that everyone does is sort of as you saw in the clip, they start leaping to solutions. And what do the solutions look like? Right? I call that leaping. So the very first flaw of the very first game, uh, if you will, is, is leaping. And this is our go-to problem-solving process. You've got a problem. People want you to sit in a room and throw ideas up. Brainstorming. In this case, it was body storming. But all the research is pretty clear. The worst thing that you can actually do when you're faced with an unfamiliar problem is just do some unfocused brainstorming because all it's good for is surfacing sort of top of mind, mediocre solutions that don't solve the problem as sort of the rope dancers showed you. So let's see how this works. I'm going to show you an incorrect Roman numeral equation. Everyone remember their Roman numerals from grade school? Right, so clearly that's not a correct equation, right? 11 plus 1 clearly does not equal 10. But I tell you that the numbers are made up of movable sticks, like uh, match picks or uh, match sticks or toothpicks. And I tell you to leave the plus and the equal sign alone and I ask you to tell me what's the least number of sticks you would need to move to make that a correct equation. You can go ahead and shout it out. Almost everyone gets there right away, a millisecond. One, right? Wrong. Listen to the question. What's the least number of sticks you'd need to move to make that a correct equation? What would be the ideal answer to least number? Zero, Zero right? Can you get there? Is it possible? It is if you pause and look at the problem differently, from different perspectives. There are actually three ways to solve this problem without moving a single stick. Look at it upside down. Some of you are actually doing that already. Look at it upside down, it becomes a correct equation. If you have trouble doing that, write it down on a piece of paper and turn your paper upside down. Or you could literally read the equation, literally right to left, right? 10 equals one plus nine. Or if you happen to be uh, visually intelligent, you might see that there's symmetry involved. You flash it in a mirror and read it off the mirror. No sticks required. Leaping to solutions, there's a lot of good reasons for why we do that. Most of it's because the problems that we solve, by and large, every single day are of a routine nature. They don't require us to think deeply. It's, you know, what am I gonna wear today? Uh, is, it, is it tall, grande, vente? What's traffic like on the freeway? We don't need to meditate deeply on why there's traffic. We just need the workaround. And the difficulty comes in that we apply that sort of intuitive, instinctive way of problem solving to deeper problems that do require us to think more deeply. And that's an issue. The second thing, uh, the second game is I call fixating. When you see the people doing the rope dance, you immediately notice that not just do they all leap to a solution, they leap to the same solution. They're all doing the same thing. And when it doesn't work, as you saw in the clip, they keep doing it. They keep doing it. 
right? For the entire five minutes, they are basically doing that rope dance. Different iterations, they'll step, they'll try and move, but they're basically doing the same thing and they don't solve the problem. That's called fixating. There's a psychology, uh, psychologists call that functional fixes. I just call it fixating. And it's the remote control cra trap. That's why I've got a picture of remote control up there. You do this all the time, right? Think about it. You come home, you're tired from work, you plop down on the couch, you pick up the remote, and you aim it at the TV. That's your brain pattern number one, TV off, fixed by brain pattern number two, power on. It works a thousand times in a row. This time, it doesn't work. What do you do? You keep doing it, don't you? Admit it, right? Because you don't want to get off the couch. That doesn't work. You keep going back to the same thing. You keep pressing the button, right? Now that doesn't work. What do you do? No, you don't change the batteries. What do you do? You roll them around, don't you? Come on, admit it. You don't change the batteries. You, somewhere in your technological wizardry, you've discovered that the root cause of the problem is those batteries somehow got jostled in that chamber. Right? Plus, you don't even know if you got batteries in the utility drawer, right? So why get up off the couch? Well, finally, you have to because you have nothing left to, to work with. You get the batteries, you put them back in, and what do you do? You go back to that first solution every single time. But the TV still doesn't go on. You go through a litany of all the things you've tried in the past. Only when nothing works do you actually get to real problem solving because that's when you sit there, you look at the problem, and you go, huh. Why isn't this going on? Why isn't this working? That's exactly what the rope dancers do with the handcuff exercise. The problem is, by the time they get to that point, time's up. So let me show you the solution to the prisoner's release. Now, what gets in the way of everyone coming up with that solution, honestly, is that we let our lazy brain take over and leave our mind out of it. In other words, we render ourselves mindless. Now, think about it. The opposite of mindless is mindful. And we probably all know sort of what mindfulness is all about, but generally speaking, we're talking about a higher order of attention. Noticing moment-to-moment -moment changes around you, being open to other perspectives other than your own, and sort of trying to fight that stranglehold that the brain has on being certain. And the question that intrigues me most is not how do we become more mindful in a general way, because there are several ways, I think, to do that, but rather how do we become more instantly mindful when we're solving a difficult problem? That's what I'm fascinated by. And I believe the answer is that we need to learn to quickly reframe our challenges to look at them from different perspectives. Have you ever noticed how other people's problems seem so easy to solve, much easier than your own? That's because you're not as close to the problem. Right? You don't share the same frame of reference that they do. And therein lies the trick. How do you distance yourself from your own problems in order to adopt and achieve a more unbiased perspective? Psychologists actually call it self-distancing. And one of the most helpful techniques that I've found that works in the field is to do two things. Suspend action, hold off on the action, and employ an imaginary third person. So let me tell you what I mean by that. Lately, what I've been doing with the handcuff challenge is I have been embedding a ringer pair in the larger group. So I secretly instruct one of the pairs to do nothing for the first 60 seconds other than study the situation, observe all the action going on around them, look at it from different angles, and then spend the remaining time considering a single question. How would Einstein solve this problem? And the reason I use that question is most people are familiar with, and if not, I remind them, Einstein's favorite quote. Remember it? If I had an hour to solve a problem, I would spend the first 55 minutes trying to determine the proper question to ask. Because once I know the proper question, I can solve the problem within five minutes. And you know, the action is almost magical, what happens. No more are they rope dancing. 
the dialogue that they do engage in has nothing to do, when I listen in, the dialogue has nothing to do with the solution, but rather the predicament that they're in, and they're trying to figure out why all the rope dancing and gyration going on around them isn't working. They spend far more time focused on the problem. They actually look like chess players studying the board. And they quickly realize that the problem is about being double looped. And the results are amazing. It's almost a, it's kind of freaky. It's a complete reversal. Almost 90% of the time they solve the problem well within the five minute mark. And what that Einstein question actually does is to inject a third party into the mix. Yeah, he's imaginary. Yeah, one of the world's greatest thinkers, but it's called the outsider effect. That's what psychologists call it anyway. And it really highlights that some, some of the recent discoveries that have been made, that when we're facing a situation that's giving us some cause for concern or stress or anxiety, we can lower the level of anxiety simply by talking to ourselves in the third person, using a pronoun like he, uh, she, or even your own name. You know, Matt will do fine if he can get the team to lighten up a bit. And what that does is to prompt you to look at your problem from a different and actually far more distant perspective as if you were an objective advisor. So one of my favorite techniques personally, though, I'll leave you with this, is um, let's say you're faced with a, uh, a challenge that's giving you anxiety. It's causing you stress. Maybe it's a change at work. Uh, maybe it is being locked in a room uh, for two days with 12 type A police officers. <laughs> um, realize that the reason you're feeling the weight of that anxiety is because you have leapt to the future and fixated on some unwarranted assumptions. A, that something will happen, and B, that it'll be bad. Step two is to give yourself some reasons why that thing you're so sure might happen, might not happen. Because think about it, you can't predict the future, no one can with any certainty. Now your stress level is reduced because you've gone from there's this thing that's gonna happen to there's this thing, maybe it'll happen, maybe it won't. Final step, come up with some good things that could happen even if things progress the way that you think they will. And those things are pretty easy to find once you ask that question. Now you've gone from here's this terrible thing that's gonna happen to there's this thing that may or may not happen, even if it does, some good will come out of it. And it's a trick I've learned over the last couple of years. I didn't have it that morning with the bomb squad. I wish I did. But on that note, um, the team did wonderful. The handcuff exercise did exactly what it was intended to do, which was to lighten up the room just a bit. That officer that was sitting next to me that warned me he was only there because he was ordered turned out to be the creative champion in the room over the course of that two days. And they designed an altogether new, far more fluid approach to handling bomb threats, and it became the new LAPD standard. So here's a final thought. And I'll leave you with this as well. It's sort of the secret, I think, the, the mega secret to winning the brain game. Whenever you're faced with an issue, realize that every issue looks different from another perspective. Okay? Once you discover that perspective, take it. If you do that, it's game over. Thank you. <laughs>